Well, uh, hello everyone, I'm John Porter. I am the Urban Agriculture Program Coordinator with Nebraska Extension. Uh, I am located in the Omaha metro area. My office is in Omaha. And uh, one of the things that we talk about the most, we get the most questions about, and we see most people growing are tomatoes. Uh, even if they just have a, a, a container on the, on the deck or they have one or two uh, tomato plants in a bed somewhere, most home gardeners grow tomatoes or it's sort of like the gateway vegetable or fruit, depending on who you're asking, uh, into gardening. A lot of people, that's where they get their, their start in gardening. Uh, so uh, since we have um, so much interest in tomatoes, uh, I give this presentation a few times to lots of different groups, uh, and we always have um, some good questions, and we always have a lot of interested people, so I'm glad that you could join us today. So we're going to go ahead uh, and get started. I'm going to talk about some of the aspects of growing tomatoes, uh, how, to, how to grow them, and then we'll finish up. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the most common problems with tomatoes, both in terms of diseases and insects, and give some basic um, IPM strategies, integrated pest management strategies, or some basic treatments for those uh, as well. Let me make sure I'm clicked on the right thing here. There we go. So one of the first things to uh, realize is that there are different types of tomatoes. Uh, and it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, we get lots of new tomatoes on the market every year. Lots of new cultivars, lots of new uh, types of tomatoes. But they fall in five different basic types. Probably the one that you're most commonly uh, familiar with the one that you see the most is a slicing tomato. Those are the tomatoes that you uh, cut across and like slice onto a sandwich. They're the ones that are usually uh, you know three or more inches across uh, and we and when we see those uh, varieties or cultivars like Brandywine or Celebrity, um, Cherokee Purple, those are all slicing tomatoes, the bigger tomatoes that you you cut up like that. Next on the list we get what we call Roma or paste tomatoes. These are those more oblong shaped tomatoes you see. You've seen Roma tomatoes a lot probably. Uh, you can actually buy them in the grocery store as well. They're very common there uh, in addition to slicing. Uh, and Roma or paste tomatoes are probably more particularly suited uh, to applications where you want to reduce the amount of water uh, that you get from the tomato. If you can see that slice across that uh, uh, on that bottom tomato, you notice that they don't have as much of that that juice on the inside. So they're actually better suited for canning. If you're wanting to make like a tomato sauce or a salsa and can it, you would actually have a better product if you use a Roma or uh, paste tomato because they have less water in them. They're meatier. Uh, they have a better texture for canning. Uh, and that's what a lot of people use them for, or a lot of people do grow them to eat fresh uh, because they do have the, the fewer seeds, the less fluid. We call it interlocular fluid. That's the, the fluid, that, that matrix around the seeds. Uh, and so a lot of people do eat these fresh as well, but they're really great for canning. And then we have three different types of the little tomatoes. So we have cherry tomatoes. Those are, are the little tiny round ones that you see kids love these. Um, they're very small in size. Uh, they're um, you know, great for salads. Uh, I've even seen the cherries and even some of the grapes uh, dehydrated uh, and almost sort of like make tomato raisins that you toss on a salad or throw in a recipe like sun-dried tomatoes, but miniature versions. Um, if you're doing you know, large size sun-dried tomatoes in a dehydrator or something, you would probably use the Roma or paste, but I've seen uh, the cherries and grapes done as like a, a, a sun-dried raisin almost. Then the grape tomatoes are a little bit larger than the cherry, and you can also see that they're oblong in shape. They're not that much bigger though, so a lot of people use the terms uh, interchangeably. And then we have what we would call a cocktail or salad tomato. 
they're actually bigger than the cherry and the grape. So they're, you know, maybe between an inch or a two inch in diameter. So smaller than a slicing, bigger than a grape or cherry, they're sort of in the middle. Uh, and some people use those a lot for salads, uh, interesting uses. I've seen them pickled uh, as well or canned uh, for a different um, things that people do with them. So uh, these are the five common types of tomato fruits uh, that you can find. And then we can talk about some different genetic characteristics of plants. And you see these two terms on the seed packet, perhaps, hybrid versus heirloom, and what's the difference? Uh, both of them are developed uh, or occur from different crossing of, of plants. Uh, there, there's, uh, you know, one, one tomato here and another tomato here, they're crossed uh, and they form an offspring. And it really depends on how stable their genetics are uh, as to whether they would become an heirloom or a hybrid. So a hybrid uh, is one where uh, we have someone that breeds that tomato, like a tomato breeder that works for a seed company, that works for a university. And they're mixing and tinkering with different types of tomatoes and they keep crossing them until they find the right set of genes to give the characteristics that they're looking for. And then they get it down to a mother plant and a father plant. And in order to get that hybrid offspring that let's say one of the most common hybrid tomatoes is celebrity, very popular. Um, you can't just save the seeds of that celebrity and get the celebrity every time you have the, the mother of the celebrity and the father of celebrity, you cross that and you get the celebrity seeds. If you were to um, save those seeds from the celebrity, which you can do, it's a myth that you can't save seeds from hybrids. You can, but what happens is you get a mix of those different genes because they're not all stable, they're not um, all set. And so what happens is when you uh, save the seeds from a hybrid, you get a few that look like that celebrity tomato. You get a few that look like the mother plant with her characteristics. You get some that look like the father plant with his characteristics. And you get some that look like the milkman. It's all just a little mix in there and uh, it's sort of random. But the nice thing about hybrids is a lot of the newer hybrids have disease resistance that, are, that is being bred in. So that can help us fight diseases and also reduce the use of pesticides, fungicides, etc. Uh, as Carol and I were talking before we got started, I do a testing program for All America Selections where we test out new varieties of and cultivars of all kinds of vegetables. And tomatoes are our most popular. And most of the tomatoes we get are disease resistance or we're testing for disease resistance. Hybrids also give us a uniform result. They're typically the ones that are sold by seed companies do well in most places of the country. And so we know that they will do well in most places uh, that we would grow them. Uh, so we get those uniform results. Sometimes an heirloom, uh, and I'll talk about those in a minute, um, they're developed in a certain part of the country. They come from you know, one certain area uh, and they do better in that area. So whenever you get the seeds, they may or may not perform well for you. Hybrids also have this thing called hybrid vigor. And it's this weird thing where when we get that mixing of the genes, when we have that mother and father that have the different genes and they cross, the plants that result from that, the seeds that come from that are actually more productive than a seed that doesn't cross. So since we don't get that, air, that crossing in the heirlooms, we find that um, we don't get that hybrid vigor. So sometimes heirlooms are less productive than a hybrid that would be similar. And then another thing that hybrids are, are really being used for is to help us develop cultivars for climate extremes. When we're looking for extreme heat, um, we're looking for um, like in some soils, extreme salt. Uh, those are being used for finding ones that do well in those areas and breeding them out uh, to, to be better prepared for those climate extremes as well. Heirlooms do have some, some pros, you know, there's a large variety. You get a lot of different flavors, lots of different colors, more so than you do hybrids, though the hybrids are coming along in their sort of creativity. Um, 
heirlooms also have cultural significance. So they come from a certain area or they come from a certain family. So they have a representation, a cultural representation. Uh, and a lot of times we hear those stories. So uh, in Nebraska, we do have one heirloom tomato, the Nebraska wedding tomato, uh, which was passed down uh, in certain areas from, I'll say like a family member to a bride on the wedding day. And then we have open pollinated uh, plants. So an heirloom is an open pollinated plant, meaning that it's um, easy to save the seeds. You either don't get a lot of cross pollination or they're self fertile, or if you save the seeds from it, it behaves just about exactly like what the plant you saved it from. Uh, and that, that's a, a function of the genetics. The genetics are very stable. And so you can save those seeds. Some of those plants like tomatoes, we save a lot more heirlooms of than say things like cucumbers or squash because of the way they flower as well. Tomatoes have closed flowers, so they're not really open to bees for pollination. You will see bees on tomato flowers, but they don't really cross pollinate uh, that much. Uh, you actually um, are more self-fertile in tomatoes. And so that's why it's easier to save the seeds from those open pollinated varieties. Another thing that we might see on a seed packet is uh, indeterminate versus determinate on tomatoes. Indeterminates are what we would call a vine type tomato where it basically keeps growing. It never stops as long as it's healthy and happy or until the frost hits and kills it. Uh, it will keep growing, it will never stop, so it can grow 10, 15, 20 feet tall. Uh, and one thing that happens is that as it grows, it sets new flowers um, from the bottom up. And so as it keeps growing, it will keep flowering and keep fruiting. So it will keep producing fruit throughout the season. Uh, so that can be very good in terms of production, if you really like that tomato. But the size of the tomatoes means that you do have to do some staking, some, some poles, and they could get quite tall. Um, we also know that um, these indeterminate tomatoes produce a lot of what we would call suckers, um, which are these little offshoot branches that can kind of make it grow really wild uh, and have lots of different branches going in different directions. But also um, having that much volume on the plant really reduces airflow and gives us a lot of diseases and actually can reduce the production somewhat. So these are ones where you might have to do some pruning, especially when young, where you have to take those, those suckers out. And the, the way that basically you think about that is, you know, if you have the, the main trunk of the tomato and then you have a side branch, there will be another little uh, shoot coming out between those two. And if you just let it go, it'll keep growing. And so you wanna cut that out. And so we have a, a nicer, neater tomato plant. Determinate tomatoes are what we would call a bush type tomato. It actually has this almost genetic predestination uh, to be a certain size. So it will grow to about that size. Uh, if the conditions aren't right, if the weather's bad, or if it doesn't get enough water, it won't grow to that tall, um, but it possibly can if the conditions are right. And so it will grow to that size and sort of stop, and it will produce fruit over a few weeks. And so uh, they aren't those tomatoes that will stay in the garden long term. Uh, excuse me. Oh, that's better. Um, since they are bush type and they don't grow as wild, uh, you typically don't need to prune them or prune them as much as you would do the indeterminate. And we have a new tomato type that is, um, I guess you could say is related to determinate but there's a lot of dwarf tomatoes now. And those are ones that you can actually grow very easily in a container. You could do these in a container, probably a bush or a determinate type you could do in a container pretty easily. If you had a big enough container, say like around a five gallon bucket. But uh, the dwarf tomatoes, some of those are, have been bred to grow between one and two feet tall. And so you could easily get by with growing them in a regular like flower pot. Uh, and it's, uh, they can be productive. Usually it's the smaller fruited varieties, uh, usually a cherry or a grape, but sometimes you can get those cocktail tomatoes uh, as a dwarf. So you can be on the lookout for those as well. 
So what are the ideal growing conditions for a tomato? Well, we want at least six hours of sunlight, preferably more, and that's direct sunlight. Um, sort of the, the basic rule of thumb is if we grow it for a fruit, so anything that has a seed in it is a fruit, so any tomato, uh, we would need at least six hours of sunlight. We do need to protect them from frost. They are not frost tolerant, uh, and it uh, depends on where you are as to when your frost dates are, uh, and sometimes that doesn't mean uh, much. This year we found uh, that may be the case. So uh, I'm in Omaha and our last frost date uh, per the, all the, the predictions and all the models is May 4th. However, uh, after May 4th, we actually did get some cold temperatures. I don't know that we got cold enough to be an official frost uh, because that's 32 degrees, but we got pretty close. So there could have been some damage on some tomatoes. We want to maintain even watering, and that's hard, especially when we have a lot of rain, because um, tomatoes are sort of like a, a Goldilocks plant. If you don't have enough water, they don't do well. If you have too much water, they don't do well. So you have to really uh, see about that balance. And then we want to monitor for any diseases and insects and treat the issues quickly as we find them. So I want to go through the top 10 issues that I see uh, in tomatoes, the things that people call about. And then I'll also share, I have a resource that I can uh, send to Caitlin and to Carol, and they can send out, I have a, a list of sort of recommended tomato varieties. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot more information than we can share here. I'll show it to you, <coughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, we can find a way to share it with the people that are interested. So first off, what is a plant disease? Uh, it's uh, some sort of abnormal growth, a dysfunction of the plant. Uh, it uh, is a result of some sort of disturbance. So we have living diseases, biotic diseases, or we have non-living diseases, abiotic, and those are caused by things in the environment. And we have a few of each on the list in addition to some insects. One thing to remember when we're talking about diseases especially is that we have to have a lot of things going exactly right in order for that disease to happen. First we have to have the plant that the disease will infect so a tomato can get certain pathogens and then we have that pathogen that infects the plant so that has to be present. Just because you have a tomato doesn't mean that it's going to get early blight or late blight you have to have the pathogen present. You have to have the right environment for that to happen too. Most of the diseases we see uh, require some sort of uh, humidity or water to get them sort of germinated and going. Uh, and that can um, take the, the uh, form of rain or it could even be fog in some places. So we have to have the right environment for all those things to happen. And then we have to have enough time for it to happen. So we, we have to have time for that to, to develop. So the best way to prevent a disease is by making sure that one of the sides of this pyramid is gone. And uh, it really depends on the disease or your ability to, to control that. So a lot of the diseases we have might overwinter in debris in the soil. And so one of the easiest ways to reduce disease is by rotating crops and that's hard if you have a very small garden but if you're planting tomatoes in the same place year after year and this goes for about anything if you're planting them in the same place year after year you end up building up sort of that that debris in the soil with the disease on it so planting them in different places uh, can really help uh, with that using mulch can keep the those the wind splash rain from splashing on that debris on the soil and splashing up onto the plant. So there are some ways that you can manage that even in a small space. I've had people that they have just a like a four by eight raised bed. How do you rotate uh, your tomatoes in there? Well maybe their tomatoes are in the bed one year and they get some containers and do container tomatoes for a year and then they change out the soil in the container and do them another another year in the container before they move them back to the bed. So there are some ways, even with small gardens, that you can do that. And that's probably one of the best techniques to reduce the diseases. 
You can also uh, make sure that your tomato plant is not, um, it, well, you can reduce the likelihood that it will get the disease if it is resistant. I was talking about a lot of the new cultivars do have resistance built in, and there's actually a secret code uh, for tomatoes in disease resistance. It's usually some sort of abbreviation or a letter that goes on there, and you can usually find that on the tag or on the seed packet uh, or on the description, and it will tell you which diseases tomatoes are resistant to. And this list is expanding. Uh, used to, we didn't really have uh, plants that were resistant to, say, late blight. We had a few that had some resistance to early blight, but they weren't common. Now we're getting more of those more commonly, and so those are being added to this resistance code list. But we look for the most common ones we see are the VFN, verticillium wilt, fusarium wilt, and root knot nematode. You see that on a lot of things. Um, but you can find more of these codes if you look hard enough. And the plant list that I will share has the, the codes for the things that, um, that we have on that recommendation list. So this one, we see all these little guys on the back of this tomato leaf, and that is aphids. We get a lot of calls about aphids. Uh, you have to remember that um, you know, they are damaging mainly the foliage of the plant, um, and they will damage the plant. You have to, to sort of think about how much damage that plant can take before you need to treat it. Um, there will be a point where if they do enough damage, it will affect, affect fruit yield uh, because it is reducing the amount of foliage that the plant has to produce the sugars and other things that need to go into the fruit. So you find these on the undersides of leaves. Uh, they can reproduce asexually, which is something interesting about aphids. Uh, there's lots of different ones. They vary by color. And they produce what's called honeydew. So they have these piercing sucking mouth parts. They, they stick their sort of mouth straw into the tomato and they suck out sap and it passes through them and they produce honeydew. So it's this little drop of sort of like a nectar that comes out their back end. And you can see that um, as sort of like a, six, uh, a sticky residue. If it's on the plant for a long uh, enough time, what happens is that fungus gets into that honeydew and grows and it will turn black. So you'll see it as black spots as well. That's the fungus growing on the honeydew, not a fungus that's attacking the plant, but the aphids are attacking the plant. So you see that as a sign. So there are some insecticides. You can use general insecticides like pyrethrum uh, or um, some of the, the general conventional insecticides. You can also uh, blast them off with water. A lot of them don't move very well. And so just blasting them off with a good spray of water can sometimes work. Or using like a, some sort of uh, insecticidal soap or oil will sometimes work because they're a soft-bodied insect. Uh, and so those can help as well. So this is actually one of those abiotic disorders, not a disease, but we see this cracking. Um, we see cracking uh, a lot around uh, the, the side of the tomato or down from the top to the bottom, or sometimes it's around the stem. And that is uh, an environmental disorder and what happens is that the fruit develops faster, grows faster than the skin can keep up with. And so that happens a lot whenever we get, um, say, a heavy rain or a watering event where the plant is taking up a lot of water at one time. Uh, or there are some varieties, especially some of the heirloom varieties, that are more susceptible uh, especially as they get ripe. And some of those really big knobby looking heirlooms you've seen, you've seen all those cracks in them. It's just because that fruit grows so irregularly that the skin can't keep up. Um, so some ways to help uh, deal with this is to, to look at the watering, use drip irrigation instead of hand watering to get that watering moderated, uh, using organic matter to, to help hold on to water and release it slowly. Uh, using a mulch as well. So getting that watering even can really help. 
Now there's nothing you can do to prevent like a heavy rain that will cause this, but getting that watering even out by using the mulch and the organic matter or by using drip irrigation can help. Um, so septoria leaf blight, so here's a disease uh, caused by a fungus. You see it as these little pinprick type of dots. If you see bigger spots than this, it's another disease. But these little pinprick type of dots you see on there, uh, they start off on the leaf and then uh, the leaf will turn yellow and fall off if you get enough of them on there. So they're, they're very small, they're brown dots. They might even start off lighter than this. Uh, they're similar to early blight, but that early blight has um, bigger blotches. Um, this one starts on older leaves, uh, so it's usually from the ground up. Uh, and this is favored by those humid conditions. Uh, and it typically waits until the plants start to set fruit. Uh, and then that's when it starts. So some ways that we can prevent this, we use mulch to keep that wind splash rain from splashing up on the plant, uh, limiting the wetting of foliage by overhead watering, uh, limiting that would be good. You can use a fungicide, you can uh, use something like a, a fixed copper, like copper sulfate or dacanil, something like that. However, I know a lot of people that grow organically, they like to use copper, but I caution you from overusing copper because copper is an element so it doesn't break down after you apply it. So it can build up in the soil if you overuse it, and that can cause long-term damage to the native population of bacteria and fungi in the soil, uh, especially the good bacteria and fungi. So you wanna watch the overuse on the copper. There is a preventative spray that you can use for a lot of the fungal and bacterial diseases on plants like tomato. You can use it on about anything. It's fairly, a fairly recent addition to the gardener's toolbox. It's called Serenade, just like you're singing to someone. S-E-N-E-R, uh, I can't even spell today. Serenade. Uh, and um, it is actually uh, an extract from a, a bacteria. So it's a bact uh, Bacillus subtilis. And you actually spray this on. Uh, and uh, you can get different types for some different diseases. But you can use that as a preventative because it is um, it is an organic, it's actually a biologic. Uh, and it basically works like yogurt does for us. So we eat yogurt to give us the good bacteria, to keep us from you know getting bad, bad bacteria, and makes us healthier. It's sort of like that for plants. So that good bacteria lives on the plant surface and sort of outcompetes any of the other bacteria or fungi uh, that's, that get on there. So it can help slow down the spread of something, but once you get a disease, it's basically difficult or impossible to eliminate from a vegetable or edible plant because we can't really use a lot of those uh, systemic fungicides on these plants. We just have to use the topical ones so we can slow down the spread or we can help prevent it by using something like a preventative like that. This one is becoming common. We get a lot of calls on it, herbicide damage. Uh, we see these uh, rolling cupping leaves. Um, depends on the, the herbicide or the severity of how much it gets as to how severe this is, or the symptoms can be a little bit different depending on the herbicide. Common uh, is 2,4-D or dicamba. Uh, and you know ways that we can help us prevent it is if we are using them, let's say in the lawn or in the garden, is to uh, not to apply them near our vegetable garden or to, to, to use the right conditions to avoid drift, like use the right temperatures, make sure it's not windy. Um, also, some people accidentally uh, do cross-contamination. They're using the same tank for herbicides or fungicides and insecticides, and uh, you could not get all of that um, residue out of there for that herbicide. So you might want to use a separate herbicide tank. Now there's really nothing we can do whenever we live in an agricultural area and we get uh, episodes of drift from nearby farms, uh, just being aware of what the symptoms are and uh, being on the lookout for those is basically all we can do. What happens when we have no tomatoes? Uh, we get this call sometimes too. A lot of times it's temperature related. Um, 
they drop their flowers when night temperatures are lower than 55 degrees uh, or sometimes when night temperatures are above 70 degrees. Toma tomatoes are sort of like that Goldilocks plant. So we have to have the right range of uh, temperatures for fruit set. It's usually between about 58 and 68. That's perfect. Um, daytime temperatures don't affect it as much except when we get very hot temperatures and uh, it's very dry. And then basically sometimes even if the fruit is pollinated, uh, it will abort that flower or abort the fruit as a way to conserve water. It can also occur if we have too much nitrogen because what happens is um, nitrogen uh, fuels the green leafy growth of a plant and it's putting so much energy into the green leafy growth that it doesn't have enough left over to develop flowers or to develop fruit. Uh, there are some heat resistant uh, varieties you can use if it's if it's a heat issue uh, but otherwise you just have to look for the right temperatures or to make sure you're not putting on too much nitrogen. Here's another one we get calls about all the time and it confuses a lot of people. It's blossom end rot. And a lot of people think it's, we get a call and it's like, I have a blight on my tomatoes or I have a disease on my tomatoes and it's not a blight. It's actually a, a nutrient disorder. We also have a lot of people say, well, it's a calcium deficiency. So I need to add, add calcium to my soil. That's not also the case either. So it is a nutrient deficiency of calcium in the fruit. And there's several things that could cause that deficiency in the fruit. Number one, uh, probably is um, uneven watering. What happens is if we water too little, we don't have the water going into the root that takes the calcium into the root with it. If we water too much, we're killing off the root hairs on the root because they, they need more oxygen. We're killing them off. And those root hairs are what's responsible for taking the nutrients out of the soil and up into the plant. So it's sort of like uh, it goes both ways. You have to have the water just perfect to avoid blossom end rot. Another thing that can, can happen is too much nitrogen again because the, the, the plant or the fruits are growing so fast that they can't take up enough calcium for the fruit. And then we get to the issues of soil. So like the very last thing on the list is soil. Either there's not enough calcium in the soil or the pH is wrong to make it available to the plant. So that's like the last thing on the checklist. We would look at um, the watering and the nitrogen first. Uh, and so there are some ways to, to treat this. Number one, if it is a watering issue, it usually corrects itself. Like the first few tomatoes will have blossom end rot, then it'll go away. Uh, it most commonly goes away on its own. We don't have to do anything. Um, we can look at a soil test to see the calcium and pH level if it's a persistent problem. Only if it's a persistent problem would you need to do that. And if it's not fixing itself in the season and you need to, if you want to get tomatoes growing, you can get a calcium nitrate spray. It's a fast acting, it's available to the plant, unlike a, like just adding lime to the, the garden right when you see it or, or adding calcium to the soil does not fix the problem because it has to break down for the plant to take up. This is a, a, a form of calcium that the plant can take up uh, really quickly. Stink bugs, so we're getting a lot of stink bugs here now. And what they do is they have these piercing sucking mouth parts that they stick into the fruit and you'll see this modeling on the fruit. Doesn't really affect the, the edibility. You can still eat the fruit. There might be little hard parts uh, where that is. But if you're farming and you're selling tomatoes, a lot of people, uh, don't like that. And that damage can occur uh, on green fruit. So they, they, they uh, damage the green fruit. You don't see that until it ripens though. Uh, and you can, it's really hard to control these. You could use like an insecticide to reduce the populations, but most of them work on contact. And so it's really hard uh, to do that. You could use like a floating row cover uh, as well. Because like I said, tomatoes are mostly wind pollinated, not insect pollinated. So if you are getting a lot of insect problems on your tomatoes, you could use a floating row cover big enough to cover the whole tomato plant um, to reduce the damage. Early blight is one of those other fungal diseases. Um, 
It starts on the, the lower leaves, usually and works its way up, but you'll notice that it has these bigger blotches, not the little pinpricks like the leaf spot. They're irregular, about half an inch in diameter. Uh, and um, it happens in the early season. Uh, you'll see these leaves die off. You'll see these brown, you know, they turn brown and crispy uh, almost. And it's the same controls for this as the leaf spot, using mulch, using a fungicide, using that protective fungicide, uh, and limiting water, uh, overhead watering. Sun scald. This is one that a lot of people misidentify or don't realize what's going on. It's a physiological order. It happens when uh, the fruit gets too much sun. Uh, it can happen anytime, no matter what the temperatures are, uh, as if the, the light is too bright. Uh, but it is worse if it's really hot because the plant um, is also sort of has a lack of water and that exacerbates the problem. Uh, it's not on tomatoes, but a good example of this that happened, uh, I got um, was talking to a producer last week in, in Nebraska and um, they were saying that their cucumbers that they were growing in their high tunnel had this damage on it. They thought it was thrips or some other insect um, but as I was talking to them, they said that they had trimmed the lower leaves off of the vines, which is common in the high tunnel. They grow them up really high, so they cut off the bottom leaves. And they had leaned the, the vines uh, one direction so that it exposed the fruit. And even though it's not been that hot, even in a high tunnel where it's warmer, it was enough sun to damage those cucumbers. And the same can happen with tomatoes as well. What happens is um, you get this sort of damage on the fruit and it's, it is an issue that area will not be very edible, but ha what happens is that that tissue is damaged and you can get other infections in there. So the ways to, to make sure to reduce this is to make sure you have good foliage cover. So if you lose all of your leaves, you're more likely to have this. Uh, avoid heavy pruning, especially all at once. If you do need to do pruning, do it a little by little, thin out the plant. And my last issue uh, here, tobacco hornworm or tomato hornworm. There's, they're two different hornworms. Both of them eat tomatoes. Um, they're these big green caterpillars. They love tomatoes. They will strip them of leaves or stems. Uh, you can hand pick them. That's the best control. They're pretty easy to spot, uh, especially if you're seeing parts of tomato plants disappear. You'll know to look for them. Um, if you see the ones that are infected, they have like little cotton buds on the back on their back. Those are infected by a parasitic wasp. You want to leave those alone, move them to an, a part of the plant where it's okay if it keeps eating for a little while. It will lose its appetite uh, because it's basically being eaten from the inside out by these little um, parasitic wasps. And it'll eventually die. And if you leave it alone, we have all kinds of new parasitic wasps that will go around and infect other plants. So that is the best control method. So that's all I have for the presentation. I will um, also show you, uh, pull up this list of tomato varieties just to show you uh, what I have. And I'll sh I'll, we'll figure out a way to share this with you. Um, so it has the, the uh, tomato recommendation varieties. It also has on there, is it an All America Selection winner? So. All America Selections is that trial program that I told you that we do. And it's a national program, it's a volunteer organization where we try out all these different new things. And if it's better than what's already on the market at that time, it becomes an All America Selection winner. Uh, so that's um, a good way to find a good uh, plant that works. These are recommendations that uh, were from a fact sheet from the University of Illinois, uh, but I borrowed them. Uh, so those are some of the recommendations and you'll see there's like early um, growing tomatoes, um, late tomatoes, and I split them out by, you know, are they like, uh, these first ones are like red slicing tomatoes uh, and then yellows and oranges, pinks, and then different paste types, uh, different small fruited salad tomatoes like cherries or grapes, and then some dwarf recommendations as well. Uh, so we'll find a way to share that with you. These are like, there's lots of different tomatoes. Um, so this is not like, yes, you have to grow this tomato. These are just some that 
that have been found to grow well in the Midwest area. Uh, but definitely a lot of people have different tastes or different varieties that they like. So it's sort of like a trial and error process as well. So that's all I have. Uh, so I will turn it back over to Caitlin or to Carol for us to finish up here. John, we have had a couple of questions. Let me look here and find the first one. Okay. Uh, can you use cornmeal as an antifungal? Oh, we see those kinds of home solutions every once in a while. And really, no one has ever been able to replicate those as an actual function of that they actually function. It's sort of like one person tried it and they thought they saw results and now everyone's doing it and it doesn't really work. So I don't know that there's actually any evidence that that works. Uh, so I would use uh, an actual labeled product. And if we are, if you are a master gardener, uh, technically that is what you have to, to do. You're not allowed to do off-label recommendations of things. It has to be uh, an approved product. So I would stick away from the, the, uh, home, the, the home remedies because they've not been proven to work. Another question is about rotation of crops and potatoes and tomatoes. And then also, how long should you leave an area before you put tomatoes back in it? Okay. So we do have tomatoes and potatoes are very closely related. Uh, they're also related to peppers and eggplant. Uh, so really the best thing is to, at the very least, not plant tomatoes and potatoes in the, the same place back to back. Best practice would be not to plant tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, or eggplant in the same place back to back, though the diseases and issues for peppers and eggplant are a little bit different than tomatoes, so you can get by with it. Typically, we recommend a minimum of a four-year uh, rotation, meaning if I have tomatoes in my bed this year, I shouldn't plant them again there uh, at least for four more years. All right, and so like if they have um, tomatoes and potatoes, it would be four years before you put potatoes where the tomatoes had been? That would be the best recommendation. Now, not, right. everyone, not everyone can do that. So it's sort of like if you can't do that kind of rotation, then you have to be really good about the other things like mulching, trying to find um, resistant varieties, uh, not doing overhead watering. The better you are at the other things, the less likely you are to have problems. All right, another question came about mulch. And if you would talk about what kinds of mulch, how thick to put the mulch, would you also address maybe a drip irrigation system with mulch? Okay. So probably the easiest mulch, the one that you can just go and buy and apply to the garden is straw. A lot of people use straw. Uh, use straw and not hay because straw doesn't have weed seeds. Hay can have weed seeds or seeds of lots of different things. You will get some seeds in the straw, but it is usually for wheat uh, or whatever, whatever grain it is. And so those are a little easier to take care of. If you're wanting to not use straw, because straw is expensive, uh, what I do is actually shred up newspaper. I have a paper shredder and shred up newspaper and use that as a mulch. You can do that. Uh, you can, if you have a large garden, you could look at using like the, the plastic mulches, but you have to use drip irrigation with those definitely. And then we often get the question, can I use wood chip mulch in my vegetable garden? And the answer is you can. Um, it is typically not the best. Um, what happens is anywhere that the mulch touches the soil, we get um, a, a deprivation of nitrogen because the mulch is a a high carbon material it's, and it wants to be decomposed by the fungi and the bacteria in the env environment. And so it pulls nitrogen out of the soil that it touches in order for that decomposition to happen. If we have wood chip mulch that lasts for a long time or is, is also like easy to, to get incorporated into the soil, let's say I'm going to plant a new plant in my vegetable garden and I pull back the soil and the, the wood chip mulch falls in, now we've broken that sort of barrier, and now that wood chip mulch is worked into the soil where it can pull even more nitrogen out. 
So you can use it, but you have to be very careful. Then the question about drip irrigation. So drip irrigation can be used in just about any garden. Uh, and it can be on top of the mulch, it can be below the mulch, because the water will work its way down in. Uh, drip irrigation is, is pretty, you know, there is a, a little learning to go along with it, um, but it is very effective, especially at keeping that splashing water from hitting the plants and also reducing the usage of water. By doing overhead watering or sprinkles, you use a lot more water than with drip. Would you also address grass clippings as mulch? So grass clippings. Uh, so some people do use grass clippings. You have to, uh, I think, think about a few things before you use them. Number one, uh, have you had any herbicide treatments on your lawn recently? Uh, that could, uh, if uh, you put it on your vegetable garden, it could damage the plants. So especially if you're using like weed and seed type of stuff, uh, that uh, could be in the grass clipping. So you want to make sure that it uh, is past that period of when it's supposed to kill weeds. If you're one that doesn't kill the weeds in your lawn, then you have to remember that there's probably weed seeds in your grass as well. So you can use it, um, but you could be introducing weeds. So I would you know, think about those two things, but it can definitely be used as a mulch. And the other thing to go along with that is leftover leaves from the fall before. They make a perfect mulch as well. Uh, so you can use them um, as a, a mulch just whole. Um, they will eventually sort of mat down uh, or you can shred them up a little bit. But if you get them too fine, uh, it mats, mats up uh, and you could get it sort of too solid and it actually blocks water uh, and um, oxygen from going down into the soil. Uh, and even as the leaves break down in some of the mulches, you have to watch for that. If they get really um, like sort of solid or compacted down, they could uh, interfere with oxygen or water moving to the soil. I see in the chat, uh, if you use shredded paper for mulch, how do you keep it from blowing away? It's very interesting. Uh, usually, um, that is mainly a concern when you put it on for the first time. Mm -hmm. After it gets wet a time or two, it actually compacts down um, to, uh, to actually stick in place. And actually I found that if you shred it, if you sort of, sort of ruffle it up some where all those little strips get inter intertwined, it um, is less likely to blow away. And then I see another question, how long after weed and feed is applied can grass clippings be used for mulch? You would have to look at the label uh, for that. Uh, I know I had some weeds that I needed to control in my lawn and the label says that it controls weeds for four months. So I couldn't use those grass clippings for four months, but it will say on the label, how long does it kill weeds? And you would want to look for that. It's different for each product. Another one that has come in is using like cardboard for mulch. Would you address that? Yeah. So I think a lot of people use that or even use that to start a new bed. They'll put down cardboard and then put soil and compost on top of it. And some of the research that we've seen actually um, says that that, even though it does eventually break down, the slow breakdown of that and the way that it sort of seals on top of the ground can uh, create a barrier for water and oxygen to go into the soil. So a lot of horticulturalists are now recommending not to use cardboard for a mulch or to start a bed because it can interfere with that oxygen and water. There is one more question in the chat. Oh, do you use a drip hose for drip irrigation? So I'm guessing, so you're, so there's a soaker hose which is like the whole hose is porous and you have water coming out. That's probably the easiest thing for a gardener to use and you can usually find those at most garden centers. So you can use that, you just have to figure out how much water does it give out. I actually use drip, drip irrigation. So it actually comes as a tubing and it has individual holes that are spaced a foot apart. Uh, and that's what I use in my garden, I bought a kit uh, from the, the drip irrigation company called Dripworks. They have like a home garden 
set. It it's covers a, a hundred square feet of garden, uh, and it came with basically a hundred feet of of this drip irrigation with a a drip hole every every foot on the tubing. Does anybody else have any questions for John? While we give people a minute to um, ask any other questions, just a reminder, I went ahead and I put um, the evaluation in the chat box for you. And it looks like it did hyperlink this time, so you should just be able to click it and then it'll take you right over into a new internet tab for that. Um, and then also, um, when John sends over that article to me and Carol, I'll be able to post that on the Soon and Garden Show website as a PDF along with his recorded video, so then you guys can have uh, to refer back to for that. 